This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Hello and welcome to The Twilight Show. Today I'm joined by a teacher who I've been connected to online for a long time, but I've never actually spoken to her before, Anna Laseva. Anna is an English teacher, university lecturer and master's student originally from Russia, but who has been living and working in Vietnam and who previously worked in Japan. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Welcome to The Twilight Show, everyone. I'm Graham Stanley, speaking to you live from Mexico City. On today's show, I'll be talking to Ana Loseva, teacher and university lecturer who has just started a second master's degree this year. As I mentioned earlier, I've been connected on social media to Ana for some time now, but we haven't had the opportunity to speak, so I'm very much looking forward to doing that today. After working as a primary and secondary school teacher for two years in Moscow, she worked for five years at Lomonosov Moscow State University, teaching general English, English for special purposes, and English for academic purposes to undergraduate and postgraduate students of physics. Whilst there, she created a website for English language department and physics faculty and helped create materials and textbooks for internal use of the faculty too. Anna's first home abroad was Japan, where she worked for four years teaching general English courses. And she also designed and taught two specific courses for students at a private international school in Tokyo, social media safety and a course about culture. As well as that, Anna taught for three years, English discussion, uh, for three years at a private university in central Tokyo, where she became involved in teacher research, teacher development, and built a reflective practice community. She currently teaches academic skills and business communication at the International School of Business in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. And I'll be talking to Anna about all of this and more after the Teacher Talk Radio News. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. It's the summer holidays for almost everyone, but apologies for those not quite finished yet. And the topic of money is not far from the thoughts of many. But Schools Week looks back at the year and reports that nearly two thirds of schools increased the cost of pupil meals this year and the large majority of schools have had to make cuts in other areas. The findings are taken from regular government surveys of school leaders and teachers, and results show that over one quarter of schools say support with energy bills made no real difference to financial positions. The pressure of the cost of living crisis affected schools in several key ways. These included a rise in the cost of pupil lunches, which had to be passed on to many parents, some schools also reported a decline in meal quality as providers attempted to reduce costs. Cuts to support staff and, in some cases, teaching staff. And schools struggled to comply with new statutory guidance on uniform, with many schools opting to introduce a second-hand uniform scheme to support parents. Recruitment pressures led to schools appointing non-specialist teachers for subjects such as history and technology, 
with many schools seeing this increased workload and stress. Send pressures also increased, with 87% of those surveyed citing lack of funds and access to specialist services as the key issue. The same publication also featured a story on exam fees, as AQA, England's largest exam board, announced increases for some of its most popular GCSE and A-level subjects, by as much as 16.5%. The changes will affect the 2024 series. The article features details of increases made by Edexcel and OCR too. Jeff Barton, General Secretary of the ASCO Union, responded by saying that this latest price hike will only serve to stretch budgets even further. Exam boards are obliged to notify Ofqual of any proposed fee increases. Ofqual monitors pricing for qualifications from the not-for-profit exam boards. The Guardian covered the nomination of Sir Martin Oliver as Ofsted's next Chief Inspector by Education Secretary Gillian Keegan. A pre-appointment hearing will take place in the autumn, but Ms Keegan said Sir Martin had demonstrated exemplary leadership and praised his work in areas of disadvantage as the Chief Executive of Outwood Grange Academies Trust. Sir Martin said he was hugely privileged to be nominated and that he would work closely with the whole sector to create the best systems in all areas. His proportion comes in spite of criticism, including from Ofsted inspectors, of his trust's record on pupil suspensions and exclusions. The article goes on to highlight the issues Sir Martin may find lurking in his intray if he is confirmed for a January 2024 start. These include the outcome of the inquest into the death of Ruth Perry and the calls for a full-scale review of the inspectorate including the scrapping of single word judgments. The inspection of children's services at a time when there is a high turnover of social workers and an over-reliance on agency workers who are having to deal with heavy caseloads. He will also have to deal with media and political pressures in a role which could see him regularly in the spotlight. Finally, the BBC reports that the government will break its own deadline to provide schools in England with guidance on policies for transgender pupils. The guidance has been promised before the summer break, but is delayed because the Attorney General for England and Wales has advised parts of the guidance may be unlawful. The guidance was expected to address what schools should do if a child wanted to change their name or use different pronouns, and whether to involve parents. Ministers were considering advising against allowing social transitioning in schools after a 2020 report found that it was not a neutral act and more information was needed about its outcomes. The Attorney General, however, has said that an outright ban would be unlawful. Ministers now have to decide what to do next, compile lawful guidance or contemplate changing the law altogether. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, this week we're going to talk about a couple of shortcuts and hacks that can make life a little easier. This may not be as innovative as some of my past life hacks for teachers, like drinking noodles, but here are a couple of things that may make a difference to your use of media in the classroom. First up, if you aren't already riding it, get on the Wakelet Wave. Wakelet is a free way to save, organise and share content create collections of web pages, videos, and basically anything with a web address under one topic. Once done, you have a shareable link to your collection. Use it to organize your lesson, flip a lesson, or create revision collections, just to throw a few ideas out there. This next hack is one of my favorites. I love using YouTube to support learning. Not only can it help keep pace in a lesson, but also it's a great reference afterwards for pupils to refer to. My biggest gripe with it though, is that pesky advert you can't skip that always decides to play when you're in full flow. Here's a secret that works nearly all of the time. When preparing your lesson, you will have watched the clip anyway to ensure it's appropriate. So just before you copy the link into your presentation or wakelet, type this on the end and T equals one. That's the ampersand or the wiggly and lowercase t equals and the number one. Now copy the URL with and t equals one on the end and your clip will start one second in. Not missing any content but skipping the adverts at the start. No need to thank me, show your gratitude with a follow and tell us what you want to know about tech. I'm Steve Woods and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. 
Hello and welcome back, everyone, and a warm welcome in particular to my special guest, Anna Loseva. Hello, Anna. How are you today? Hello. Doing very well. Thank you. It's uh, Saturday late night, but I'm full of energy for a conversation. <laughs> yes. Early morning. Well, not so early for me, but early morning for me and late night for you. What time is it there where you are? Um, it's around 11, getting, getting to 11 p.m. in Ho Chi Minh City. Wow. So, and I, I usually start by asking my guests to talk about how they became involved in education, how they became teachers. What was it with you? What, what was it that attracted you to becoming a teacher and how did you get started? Um, before I get to that, thank you, Graham, I'll get sure. to that. Uh, but I want to I wanna say a little bit. Uh, previously, you mentioned that um, we never met, which is true. <laughs> we never met face to face. That's uh, right. But I, I, I don't know if you would remember, probably not, how we got to meet online. It's kind of difficult sometimes to 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 pin that down, <laughs> pin that moment of getting uh, please, to meet somebody online. And uh, please remind me. Please I remember, remind me. I remember. Um, maybe it was 2011 or 2012. Uh, I was taking your uh, you and Paul Braddock. Remember oh, yes. Paul? Yes. We're doing we're doing a course online course on gamification something can't ah, remember the details okay this was with um, the TESOL was, electronic village online maybe i think so yes electronic village online they had many courses That's available right. and for me at that time at that time i was really into technology more definitely more than now uh, very enthusiastic so i learned about gamification from you and paul in that course Oh, that's wonderful. That's great. I was trying to remember how, what our connection was, but I, I couldn't uh, figure it out. So that that's great to know. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> yeah, it's it's always tough with online acquaintances, right? Exactly. That's great to hear, though. Um, yeah, gamification <laughs> I became, I was very interested in quite some time ago, but it seems to have continued being popular with a large number of people. And it keeps coming back as something that uh, people are attracted to. I guess you're not that interested in it at the moment, or not using it much at the moment. No, not at all. But uh, when we when we keep talking, I can uh, return back to this idea as it reappeared. Great. The concept of gamification re reappeared in my most recent study, <laughs> in the most un unexpected unexpected moment. <laughs> um, oh wow! But I can uh, go back to you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I can go back to your question about how I started. Sure. Okay. So long as we don't re don't forget to uh, for you to tell us about the gamification bit later. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll try to. I'll try to remember. <laughs> I'll try and remember um, as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think uh, it's true to say, like many teachers, maybe like I was. I did not think that I want to be a teacher. Uh, mm -hmm. I did not even think I was interested in education as such when I was 18 mm. uh, and I was making my choice which uh, university to uh, to choose for study um, and yeah. uh, especially so that uh, especially so that in middle school and high school I studied in a class which was specializing in maths and physics mm. uh, so I sort of majored in maths and physics <laughs> for 7 years right uh, and uh, in fact by by high school in, in Russia, high school was two years. Yeah. By then, I realized that I did not want to pursue my career in that in any areas related to that, <laughs> or I would have to to use that knowledge. So you didn't um, want to be was, you didn't want to be a mathematician or a physicist. No, I did not want to be that. No, <laughs> <laughs> I did fairly well. Uh, I did fairly well, um, which helped me later. I think uh, in my in my next. Um, in my first big university job, mm -hmm. um, but which we'll get to. But no, I think I was among very few, not the only, but maybe one of the two or three people from my class of 28 students uh, mm -hmm. who did not did not have a life <laughs> related <laughs> to, to math and physics and engineering and that sort of thing. So did you, um, did you drop out? Did you drop out or did you complete the course and decide not to continue? No, I completed. I completed. I took all exams, um, and uh, then 
just as <laughs> it was very funny. The last year of studying in high school, when everybody uh, was focused on getting extra extra classes to help them with the university entrance exams, which were yeah. different back then. It was it was 2003, uh, and back then we did not have a state examination, so you mm -hmm. had to study specifically for university um, mm -hmm. university requirements, whatever you choose, whatever you chose. Uh, and so all of my classmates were really studying hard and spending hours <laughs> with extra physics classes and extra math, algebra and other other words <laughs> I do not remember now um, but I had to uh, study English and um, I think it was quite interesting uh, situation for me to be in <laughs> I was really the only person in my class doing that um, so the choice that I made was based on the fact that I wanted to go against the grain I felt like I, I had to do something that didn't have to do with the numbers and figures because yeah. that was a little too abstract for me. I felt like I could not, I don't, I don't really know how to apply that, you know? Right. So I wanted to, I loved writing in Russian um, and I loved socializing, I suppose, yeah. uh, to a certain extent. So I wanted some, I wanted some vocation where I would have to deal with people in my life. Didn't really know, really no specific, no specific view of what that could be, um, for a while I intended, I thought, I wondered if I could be a journalist, mm -hmm. but maybe I hadn't, I had a, I have my own like, view of what being a journalist means. <laughs> so, um, when I when I realized what it is, uh, basically I chose, uh, and I wanted to study English. It was interesting. Um, uh, it was easy enough for me. Basically, languages, Russian and English, was easy. I I was an avid reader, um, and uh, I wanted to continue that. You know, I wanted to be doing what I love doing. <laughs> so, the the pedagogical university was, was uh, I think, sort of an easy choice for me to pursue mm -hmm. uh, a degree where I would be dealing with English, dealing with language, and also somehow with people, you know, so it's a, a humanity-based degree that felt like I could I could do it. Um, and um, I'm presuming, not... I'm presuming, Anna, that you, mm -hmm. you already spoke English at that point when you decided to go for that in that direction. Uh, I I was uh, <laughs> I think I thought that I could speak English, but mm -hmm. then the first day, uh, so for the first for the last year of high school, um, I was enrolled in a pre course at my university where I where I chose to uh, study at Moscow T City Pedagogical University. Yeah. So for a year, uh, I had to I had to attend uh, like a three or two types of classes to get prepared for their examination specifically. Mm -hmm. And so on the, on the first day when I came <laughs> when I came to like a, a speaking skills class, we had grammar and speaking and reading. I like yeah. extensive sort of, uh, not so much intensive, mostly <laughs> uh, reading class. When I first came to the speaking class, uh, I was shocked how far behind behind anybody else I was. Oh, because really? uh, all of the people, in, yeah, because all of the uh, people in my group, uh, my future my future university mates, mm -hmm. they were coming for, um, from an entirely different background. They were coming from schools and classes that specialized in language. <laughs> and of course. I came from... Uh, background of specializing in math and in my school um, I was good at English but you know you come out to university education and suddenly you are you're exposed to a, such a variety <laughs> of people that makes you become more humble I think uh, oh, and yeah. it definitely definitely was a big shock for me and uh, put a lot of pressure so I studied studied a lot to reach a level that would actually allow me to enroll in that university oh great and then after university, I know that you started as a primary and secondary school teacher in Moscow. What was that experience like? And did you decide that you wanted to teach? You well, you must have decided that you didn't want to teach primary and secondary students because you then moved on, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was another um, another interesting story. So that university, um, kind of a um, contract of sorts that you mm -hmm. were signing with a school. Uh, when you started with the with the college, uh, when you started was that after you graduate, you will work for a certain number of years. I don't remember how many you will work in a Moscow school. So this is sort of a, an incubator for English language teachers for Moscow schools that university. Right. Um, so I kind of knew I, I kind of knew that I would have to be a teacher, but I thought, you know, I can do it for a couple of years and, and then and then we'll see what happens. Mm. But um, in Towards the end of studies, we studied for five years back then. Um, in the fourth year, we had to do a obligatory teaching practice, like um, a month in a school where they send you. They have a contract 
uh, and there is a supervisor, teacher, trainer of sorts. Um, and yeah. you go through the pedagogical exp in, in class experience. Yeah, uh, applying applying your knowledge that you learned for three years. Uh, and that was the time the, that made me fall in love with teaching. <laughs> so basically, oh wow! Um, the, after after the very first class, not knowing what's going to happen, I was prepared of course and i had a very nice supervisor at that school she was very helpful she sat in our class and we had um, a group maybe six or seven uh, students who were also doing the teaching in that in that school with the different classes mm -hmm. uh, and then we had some nice feedback sessions together we had planning sessions together we planned some extracurricular activities for the kids at school and so that month was so amazing <laughs> that right after i finished uh, the obligatory month and we had to go back and study because we were still students um, but what I did instead I finished I finished that um, teacher training on the, let's say 31st of September mm -hmm. and uh, in the end of October I was already employed almost full-time at a at a private school near home so in my neighborhood <laughs> I started looking for schools where I could uh, where I could work because I really really fell in love with uh, teaching and specifically was a middle school I think for the most part yeah so it was uh, quite unusual for the past for the last two years of my study at university I was studying full-time and also working full-time at that school oh wow that must have been difficult yeah. to fit in everything um to be honest I don't remember um I don't remember being swamped so much as uh I guess I had so much energy <laughs> back then <laughs> and uh I really enjoyed uh the challenges uh, and everything was new, um, and I, I really wanted to make uh, make my own activities, you know, make my own uh, vocabulary cards, make my own crosswords. <laughs> it was 2006 yeah. or seven, I guess. So it was pre uh, pre online world, at least for me. I was not yeah. connected in any way, so it was a, it was a very creative time, I think. And maybe that's what that's maybe exactly what I uh, fell in love with in this. And profession of education is that there is a lot of opportunity for you to be creative and express yourself in in, dif in different ways and also communicate right so of course yeah that that's... was uh, that was very nice great but then you moved from working with children towards working with young adults teenagers at university is that right yeah that's right the move from school happened um due to administration issues mm -hmm. So um, I think mm, now, especially mm -hmm. now that uh, I got to start studying uh, for my for my second degree, and it's related to managing and leading educational institutions, so kind of administrative administrative side of education. Yeah, um, and uh, I definitely can see how, how important it is to have good administration, <laughs> uh, to have support to offer a support for teachers, to understand what sort of problems teachers have, what kind of help they need, how to create the, to really create, try and create the environment. So yeah. those things, um, I did not, I did not receive that at that school and it was quite a shock for me. And basically um, I, uh, uh, I had to quit because I couldn't, uh, I couldn't deal with, uh, with the environment, you know, <laughs> it right. just didn't feel right. There was a change in administration, uh, and so for a year it went very smoothly, and then the next year, um, the director of studies changed, and the environment flipped entirely. And uh, I just did my best to complete, and then I and then I had to go. I was kind of disillusioned even in school, in the whole school education because of that. So it was right. it was a little sad for me because after that, after that maybe for about six months or four months, I questioned whether I should teach <laughs> oh really that's um, uh, I, I blocked it. shame yeah, yeah i think i tried I think, to i think i yeah i think school leadership is so important isn't it really um as, as you've just sort of shown i think it can really change the the feel of a place and whether it's a good place to work etc as a teacher and a good place to be as a learner as well i think yeah definitely so i was a uh, questioning my choices um, and because I uh, I graduated so basically I graduated the summer in the summer I graduated from university I got my degree uh, and uh, in September uh, in October um, I finished my contract and I quit and uh, until February I guess uh, 
four or five months, um, I was I just had uh, tutoring, uh, tutoring mm -hmm. classes, some some teaching some kids, but really thinking, what can I do? <laughs> maybe I made All right. maybe I can go some some other direction. But luckily, luckily, uh, I got a um, I uh, I got a place at uh, Moscow State University physics mm -hmm. faculty to teach physics majors. Um, and that was the beginning of my um, life as a university teacher, which is, I think this is important because this is exactly the right uh, age range, <laughs> the right yeah. place where I feel like I fit. You know, I know, how, yeah. I know, I think I know how to talk to these people. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I can make good connections. I think I can relate in terms of academic, academic goals, like I can explain um, better. Uh, so maybe that's the... Was a godsend of sorts. <laughs> the of job. course, of course. And you ended up there teaching physics undergraduates and postgraduates, which ties in with what you were studying before as well. So that was, is that the reason why you got the job or the reason what, what attracted you to the job? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I never uh, thought if that could be part of the reason why I was given the job. No, I think. Right. Um, I think my I think the boss, um, very wonderful, wonderful woman. So once again, the the manager, the person in charge, is a decisive factor. <laughs> yes. In the environment and in the in hiring process as well, shall mm -hmm. I say? <laughs> um, so I think she was just um, interested. She was keen to have some fresh blood, uh, some nice, good energy uh, in the department. Uh, other teachers were middle-aged or on the older side even. So they, they had already worked at the faculty uh, for many years at that mm -hmm. department. Um, but, um, I think I was the youngest for 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 a year or a couple of years. I was the youngest and I was, mm -hmm. what, 24, maybe 23? So pretty mm -hmm. young. <laughs> uh, it was amazing. I'm very, very, very thankful for uh, for the chance. And uh, I read... And it was quite... Ch and again, it was a challenge. Mm -hmm. I read I read on, on your website... Yeah, that... go ahead, Graham. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think there's a little bit of a delay. Um, I read on your website that you became involved in creating materials and textbooks while you were there. Um, they were in fi about physics, I, I guess, English and physics. Was that right? Uh, um, yeah, uh, partly, partly true, uh, because I was teaching a range of students, of freshman students, uh, that was general English physics with the ESP mm -hmm. side of it so it was just preparation uh, then second year uh, second year students that was the beginning of ESP classes and that's materials that were provided old school mm -hmm. 1970s 80s <laughs> from the vaults of the library uh, that was already very uh it was it was information from my physics textbooks and mm -hmm. in the language of physics thermodynamics uh and so on astrophysics and so on um being able to to talk about the formula to, t to talk about the processes in english right yeah. uh, so it was uh, it was a challenge for me to to understand to understand that to a certain extent because obviously this is a university so the Mm -hmm. language i had to learn that area of language but in addition i had to kind of understand where <laughs> where does my knowledge of physics support me and where does it stop you know because of in course. some in some ways the content for example the text itself the text that we had to study uh sometimes i understood to a certain level and then over i had to explain i had to ask my my students to explain it to me, <laughs> uh, which is, I suppose, um, helpful helpful for, for them. Uh, yeah. But maybe like, so I'm guessing, um, I'm guessing, Anna, that you you actually I'm ended a up curious person, and I was very curious. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm guessing you ended up learning quite a lot more about physics during that period of time. I fell in love with astrophysics. Uh, I had. My favorite, my favorite astrophysicists, <laughs> and their uh, and some BBC shows that I watched uh, yeah. just to understand what's happening. Um, so, yeah, definitely, uh, I I I got I got a new interest in my life at that time. <laughs> That's great. 
a um, very on a very layman level. Of course. Layman. Of course. But um now really interesting. And and then you ended up moving to Japan, which is quite a change from uh from what you were doing. How how did that come about? Um that longest and uh, most important story in my <laughs> In my in my talk today, um, so in two thousand in two thousand eleven, um, mm-hmm. I'm gonna start from from the start. Sure. Um, in two thousand eleven, I got into a car accident. Oh. And uh, I had a brain concussion, which, uh, so I had to stay in bed for I don't know three weeks, maybe mm-hmm. I couldn't go to work, maybe three or four weeks. And in that time, um, I used uh, I had I had free time. <laughs> I didn't need to create new new materials. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't feel like I could do that, but I couldn't I couldn't just do nothing. So somehow I got on Twitter uh, in 2011 because of okay. that. Okay. <laughs> um, and on Twitter, um, I met. Um, I started uh, building my personal learning network back then. <laughs> yeah. And I met started meeting people um uh, like like so many of people from the elt community mm-hmm. uh, and i met chuck sandy um, oh yeah and barbara hoskins and barbara hosking sakamoto um and steven herder uh, and in 2011 they were beginning they were launching international teacher development institute itdi mm. um, and somehow um i was in the team of writers for their materials for their course of English for teachers, we had a team, they made they they found <laughs> Chuck found a team um, of teachers from all over the world just through Twitter. Um, okay, from Indonesia from Brazil from Russia everywhere, <laughs> um, and we worked together. Um, so basically, in two thousand eleven, I found. I opened the door, or rather, the door opened, <laughs> and I saw suddenly from from my bed um, in the south of Moscow. Uh, I found that the, there is a world of ELT out there which I had not known about. I knew right. nothing about that. <laughs> I did not have. I did not know about the conferences. I did not know about the opportunities to teach English abroad, um, and uh, then I started participating in different events um conferences going places just out of curiosity out of interest because i had energy because i realized that this is exciting <laughs> this is exciting uh, of course and um in the, in 2013 i went to japan um to present uh-huh. um, and and barbara uh, Barbara and everybody else was Japan based, my Japan based and Korea based friends. Uh, we met and many others, <laughs> too many to name. Um, and so when I was there, um, I felt like, well, wouldn't it be, it would be so amazing if I could, could, could work here. Uh, and I remember very clearly the exact moment in the train where I said that. And when Barbara <laughs> said, well, why not? Why can't you? <laughs> let's let's make it happen. Let's let's make it happen. If you dream Wonderful. about it, what's, why not? She was she was so matter of fact about it, and I thought, well, you know what? I like this. I like this style. Maybe it suits me. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Why not? Um, and so I returned, and then I organized, started thinking about, about it seriously, and uh, not without not without the help of my friends from Japan. Yeah. I got uh, that first job. I got that first job in an international school uh, in Tokyo, uh, and I moved in 2015. Wow, wonderful! And you are how long were you there in Japan? Um, from 2015 to 2019, so that must be four years. Four years, and I think you you did lots of different things, didn't you, when you were in japan you got involved with teacher research teacher development built a reflective practice community designed courses on social media safety and culture it's quite a lot of different things yes 
it was a lot. It's true. <laughs> now, when I think about it, I was very productive, and I think I had a lot of, uh, yeah, I had a lot of energy, uh, and the move, the move energized me in 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 that professional way a lot. And the environment again, I just can't help thinking how important it is. The environment and the community there enabled uh, all these things, made them made them possible. And how did you enjoy living and working in Japan, in in Tokyo in particular? It was lovely. It was so wonderful. Uh, it was my first. It's pretty far, you know. <laughs> like, yes, I lived in Moscow. <laughs> I lived in Moscow my whole my whole life until then, and then suddenly one day I say to my parents, "I'm gonna live in Tokyo." <laughs> Pretty far. <laughs> yeah, I can uh, imagine. And it was <laughs> so. It was a. Uh, I'm pretty proud of myself because uh, it was uh, everything, every possible challenge that you could imagine was my challenge. Right. It was right. a different language. It was a different culture. It was uh, living by myself. Um, um, it was a new job, new context. It was my first job teaching English to students who do not understand my language, right? Mm, yeah, of course. Yeah, so um, it was uh, it was not e- it was not easy, especially in the first year, uh, because my and for the first year I worked in a high school, mm-hmm. international high school, um, and I did not have most of my colleagues were Japanese. Mm. Um, I had maybe three. I had a boss, Peter, who's Australian, very wonderful, wonderful person, supported me a lot. Um, and a couple of colleagues, uh, our teachers. Uh, so in in the immediate workplace, I did not, I did not have a lot of, uh, of community, you know. And the people mm-hmm. there, uh, my 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 colleagues, um, they were they were they are. I don't know. <laughs> married married people with children, so yeah. our lives were a little different. You know, it was not possible to hang out uh, after work because they had to go to, back home. Uh, so uh, it was also a little bit difficult in that regard. Mm-hmm. But then, uh, but then again, students were uh, students were great, and I had a, again a nice nice chance to express myself creatively. You already mentioned. Uh, the courses that I could design, I was actually encouraged to do that. I had right. to, like Peter asked me, we we need you to teach something. <laughs> we need you to design yeah. some some courses that would engage engage our students and they would learn English through basically in clear in a clear way, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Through through content through content. What can you do? What are you What are you interested in? Uh, and that's. That sort of environment is, is very good for me. <laughs> so it was nice. I created a library at that school mm-hmm. um, from for extensive reading classes. I also I was hoping to kind of launch a long-standing extensive reading program for students at that school. Uh, I was designing, I was, was working on designing it, but then I, I got a job at a university and that was a better, better, better path for me, I thought. Yeah, you've already said that that that's the age group you feel more comfortable teaching. Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, how did things develop? Lovely. Sorry, how did things develop from there then? Um, yeah, and then I uh, then I got the job at Rikyo University, uh, what a wonderful, wonderful place. <laughs> uh, and I guess those three years at that university were exactly the time when. I was most productive in many different ways, uh-huh. um, and uh, there's there's many many reasons for that. But I think the biggest reason is the fact, um, the structure, the organization of the department. Uh, it was an English discussion department, so mm-hmm. uh, we t- we taught uh, English discussion to freshman students, different levels, but same same class. Uh, they worked within a unif- unified curriculum, so we all were doing the same class at the same time <laughs> in different rooms to different students. And uh, Riku University is quite quite large, quite big. Uh, and my colleagues in that department there were about forty five of them, maybe forty five. Right. <laughs> so that's a lot of that's a lot of a lot of teachers. And me, it was the first time that I 
I had a staff room with so many teachers. And it's a, it was a very international environment. We had Japanese, Chinese, a few Russians, not one. <laughs> um, um, South African, probably, Jamaican, definitely, uh, New Zealand, Australia, so all over. Um, wow. It was it was a very interesting place to be, <laughs> you know. Uh, and teachers were different. Teachers formed formed their own uh, their own groups, of course. But also, we had a lot of teacher development sessions, professional development organized by the school, mm -hmm. um, and that helped uh, me, uh, of course, to understand how the program works. But also it helped me think of my own ways and kind of be on my toes. It kept me on my toes in terms of oh, how I want to develop because among 45 teachers there, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of this sort of uh, research and action teacher energy. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you, it was there that you became um, so, involved. You became involved with teacher research, was it? Yeah. Uh, we had to, we had to you know, do some projects every year. Uh, mm -hmm. And publish the results of those projects. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that was a, just a very good experience, very nice way to organize professional development at your department. I think now, because <laughs> um, people, uh, some some years, uh, the research had to be kind of more within the boundaries of what they expected us to do. Uh, then the for the in the in my last year there, in the, my third year, uh, I was. Uh, I was free to choose what's interesting for me. So I chose uh, mentoring, how to organizing mentoring and teacher support systems in, in that sort of environment. So it was just so, so open <laughs> and so interesting. And, and there was time uh, allotted for that. And there was an opportunity to publish within, uh, within the department that, because they, uh, they published their own journal. So it was, it was a really great experience. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And then about four years ago, Anna, you, I think I'm right in saying you, you then decided to leave Japan and moved to Vietnam. What prompted that move? Um, yes, indeed. That was four years ago. <laughs> um, what prompted that move uh, was actually um, another, and it was another, it was a result, a result of another involvement in teacher development in Japan. Mm -hmm. Um because I I attended JALT uh, conference. This mm -hmm. is the big uh, conference for English language teachers in Japan. I attended it um, annually every year, yeah. uh, and um, I participated. Uh, I was a member of a teacher development special interest group because mm -hmm. teacher development is by and large the most my 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 biggest interest and has been my biggest interest. Yeah. Uh, my own <laughs> and other teachers <laughs> for other teachers as well. Um, and so in that um, within within the conference, at some point, I learned about uh, teachers helping teachers group, mm -hmm. I guess. Maybe they have their own SIG special interest group. I can't remember now. But teachers helping teachers just sounds like exactly like something I want to be doing. I wanted to be doing mm -hmm. back then. And so uh, the idea for that group the idea for that group was that they organized um, teacher workshops and conferences some events in countries in Southeast Asia mostly Southeast Asia um, where teachers from different universities from Japan would come uh, and uh, give a day of workshops let's say or a couple of days and would maybe travel around the country a little bit so for a couple of days or for a week, uh, with the help of people on, uh, on the on the ground, <laughs> uh, there were these trips organized: the Philippines, Laos, uh, Vietnam, uh, mm -hmm. Bangladesh. I think I'm not sure, but um, I found out about it in 2007, late 2017, I think. And so in March 2018, I joined uh, um, Teachers Helping Teachers event in Vietnam. So. I applied with some ideas for workshops about reflective practice, which I had been doing uh, regularly for four years by then, I think, maybe three mm -hmm. years. Um, so on the topic of my interest and sort of competence, I suppose. <laughs> I um, And then I joined that, uh, that trip and I went to Vietnam for the first time in 2018. 
and we presented a group of a group of uh, teachers presented uh, in locations, I believe, to so two different cities. Um, and this yeah. one in the south of Vietnam and one uh, in central Vietnam. We gave different workshops. They organized the organized activities for us and wonderful food <laughs> and mm -hmm. treated us so well. And so that was a short trip, six days, maybe, maybe seven days. But I just uh, fell in love with the country. I fell in love with the energy of teachers and the students as well. Um, it seemed like big contrast for me at that time with the Japanese students. Uh, and I'm not saying it in any negative way, describing uh, yeah. Japanese students, because I love teaching them as well. But uh, the classroom itself just felt very different. Um, uh, so I felt like I felt like it was a good time, good time to move. And when I lived in Japan, I traveled in Southeast Asia quite a lot, as mm -hmm. possible in my university break time. Um, and I felt like in in general, Asia is a good is the right place for me to be. And yeah. I thought that Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia, <laughs> feels like, like this could be exactly the right place, or at least. At least I needed to, I felt the need to explore what teaching is like in places like Malaysia, places like Thailand or Vietnam. And Vietnam was the choice that I made. Great. And um, you are teaching at a university school of business, I believe. And you're teaching those adults business or English as well? Uh, you know, good question. I'm not teaching business of course okay uh, although this is <laughs> this is a business school um, the, um i teach in a in a program uh, which is a program of western sydney university in mm -hmm. vietnam so they have their campus it's been open for i don't know 12 years maybe or so right um and they offer programs degrees bachelor's degrees and master's degrees uh with um with a certificate from Western Sydney, Australia. Okay. Um, so the students are business students, um, but um, in the beginning I was teaching uh, like prep courses, EAP, yeah. to help students reach the required level, those mm -hmm. who could not take IELTS and get the desired, uh, the desired numbers on paper. <laughs> we yeah. help them in the intensive courses. Uh, and then, and then I was also teaching academic skills, so like a wider, not not language skills, but a wider range of necessary skills like research and critical thinking and writing, writing different genres uh, and debating as well. So okay. And recent recently, I started teaching business academic skills. It's a it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, combination of business communication and academic skills basically uh, a variety of academic and soft skills, uh, which students in an international Western, let's say, Western school, university environment uh, need to develop. A lot of teamwork, uh, a lot of autonomous learning, a lot of writing of different sorts of things, research, referencing, this, this sort of thing. So that's, that's, my current, that's my current job. Okay. Very interesting. And um, what about living in Vietnam? How do you find that? And how does it compare to living and working in Japan, apart from what you've already told us about, of course? Well, I love Vietnam very, very, very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of, of course, I, I love Japan too. And in Japan, in fact, um, in Japan, I had a much... Uh, bigger reach the, in the community, in the teacher community. I had a lot of friends there, uh, yeah. obviously from Rikyo, which I said it was just it's a nice, very nice. So, so many, so many friends and the Jolt friends and all over Japan. Very nice, big, big community and uh, moving me in the in the in the nice, <laughs> active direction in terms of in terms of professional development. Uh, so, and if I compare that element of community. Uh, here in four years, I have not managed, unfortunately, to develop, acquire, find that community. Um, mm -hmm. 
it doesn't of course it doesn't mean that there are no that there are no people who are interested in teacher education or development this is absolutely not the case because uh, facebook which is huge in vietnam mm. is used for all different purposes including of course uh for uh, connecting teachers uh though it has huge groups of teacher vietnamese teachers sharing resources uh discussing posting researching everything uh um, but somehow I'm I, I don't I'm not sure how <laughs> how I'm not there. Uh, I don't know. It just didn't happen in a natural, organic way, you know, that right. it happened before. Um, so not yet, at least. Um, but I did attend a conference, and also COVID happened. Let's not forget. Of course, <laughs> <COVID happened. laughs> that's in these four years. That's so about two years of of the last four, isn't it? Really, practically. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And here in Vietnam, uh, we did have later than everybody else in 2021, but we had in Ho Chi Minh City quite a serious lockdown where for four right. months I did not leave my apartment. And uh, online online teaching truly is great uh, when it's great, but it does isolate teacher, I think. Of course. Um, at least it did, maybe it did so for me. I'm not sure. But anyway, I did attend a, a face-to-face conference the past week. This past weekend, a week ago, and uh, it was uh, it was great. I have to say, I remembered I remembered the feeling <laughs> of being at a, at a face-to-face conference. And that I was the present. that was I the first present. time, was it, <laughs> since the pandemic? The first time you've been to a face-to-face conference? Yes, yes, yes. It was the first time since maybe February two thousand nineteen. Wow! Since, since I moved, since I moved to Vietnam, that was the first time. So. Um, um, it it did give me uh, some some thoughts about whether whether I want to continue <laughs> this because the conference here very uh, quite interesting and I enjoyed and I learned some and I saw presentations that made me think you know um, mm-hmm. and people what's what's best even though I don't have community or feel like I have community in the way that I imagine it. <laughs> to be or the way I knew it to be in Tokyo, uh, people mm-hmm. here are so genuinely interested in engaging uh, with other teachers, so genuinely interested. And so many, uh, a few a few teachers on the break just started talking to me and immediately they start talking about their schools and it's so easy to have a conversation with them, mm-hmm. <laughs> really about education, about their schools and some faraway province or about the research that they're planning to do. And uh, it's just a, it's a, it's, it's a nice environment, I think. Um, and English language education in Vietnam is uh, really burgeoning and uh, it's, it's, it's bubbling, <laughs> it's happening. Uh, yes. And like I said, in 2018, I saw that spark in teachers' eyes and they really wanted to consume as much information as they could. And they still, they're still, it's still happening. So. Five years later, is still happening. So, if I compare that, I did. Uh, yeah. Then, of course, the biggest difference. The biggest difference is um, in Japan. I did live alone, and here I did do live with my partner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> lived in Korea back then. So right. it makes you know it, it makes a difference. <laughs> it makes of a difference. Of course, of um, course. Uh, so, uh, wonderful, wonderful food, a uh, friendly people um and when i say friendly i really really truly mean it so so kind and great and everybody wants to uh, help and support um i don't know just a very nice uh, very nice vibes <laughs> beaches there's a lot of them it's very easy to go very easy to travel in the country as well yeah. uh, and country has a lot and country has a lot to show uh, and a lot to see of course. So I yeah. love Vietnam. Wonderful. And then recently you've started studying for a second master's degree. And clearly you're an advocate of lifelong learning. But what drew you back to studying again? And what are you studying exactly? Yeah. Um, I had been thinking about maybe since I moved to Vietnam, or maybe even, even a little bit before, interested in um, how exactly higher education works Mm -hmm. in terms of how it's managed and what are some principles behind it and how it's 
led, how it should be led. So it's, um, that had been on my mind for a few years. I did some free Coursera courses, future learn or something on the topic mm -hmm. of leadership and education. So I guess my mind, my mind was moving towards that. It was in that direction for a while, leadership and education. And I was looking for programs. I was looking for maybe some certificate courses that are more uh, manageable in terms of finance <laughs> than a full, yeah. full blown degree. Um, and then, and then suddenly, you know, uh, when the right time comes, it does. <laughs> of course. Uh, for a thing. And so my school, my school, my, my employer, um, they started a new program. So they had MBA program going and yeah. I was, and I was an AMA, a teacher in that program as well with the academic skills element, supporting students, uh, MBA students. Uh, and they just started a new master program, master in education, in leadership and management. Uh, and when I found out about that, I wanted to be involved somehow. And so that's how I ended up studying it. I was an M in the first batch of students uh, doing that, doing that program in, in this course. So that's how that's how it happened. It's just uh, what I was looking for just fell into my lap. That sounds great. And what is it about uh, educational leadership that appeals to you? I mean, you've already hinted at it um, previously that you know that your own experience has shown you that it's so important and it changes the atmosphere, et cetera. But what is it that you think um, it really attracts you from a personal point of view? Uh, yeah, I, um, this is a good question that I, I had to I had to answer, it, I think, exactly that question. In the interview, <laughs> signing, signing up, <laughs> signing up for the program. <laughs> so this, my answer is somewhere in a paper in some room. <laughs> um, no, but the thing is, I have been interested in professional development and teacher development, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. reflective practice and creating community, and uh, maybe even creating community within a workplace. So. Um, let's go back to those Facebook groups that I just mentioned. So yeah. they're, they're groups, uh, Vietnam-based or international groups. And we we have seen these groups develop from the beginning, right, of, uh, of Facebook. In 2011, when I joined Facebook for ELT purposes, <laughs> they were Facebook groups already. And they, um, they, of course, are a great place for teachers to get connected from various contexts, from various backgrounds and share, right? We all know that. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess I guess from being excited about that element of that sort of community, I slowly started to pay more attention to the community that can be or should be created uh, within a workplace and specifically at university. So schools are maybe a different beast that I don't know very well. <laughs> I only worked for two years. It was 15 years ago, and I didn't have a great experience, right? So right. It's, it maybe, maybe it stayed somewhere at the back of my mind. But I did have a great experience uh, in terms of teacher community at Rikyu University in Tokyo. There were some ups and downs. There were some things that I didn't quite agree with, <laughs> but okay. I did have uh, kind of, I thought about it a lot of what happened, and I discussed it. Uh, with other teachers who wanted to consider those elements too. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, at the moment, I'm interested how, <laughs> what needs to be done? What are the factors mm. that can uh, enable creating an environment for teachers, for lecturers at university uh, that would make the space for them to learn together, <laughs> so, so yeah. that a space for them to be connected, like on Facebook, but in a in a meaningful way for that particular context, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. The teachers who are not specifically specifically like lecturers who may, may come from different departments. My mm. university here is uh, quite small, uh, so just the beginning stages. They're they're developing, they're hiring more lecturers, but we don't have a staff room, so right. We don't have a place to talk. We have we have a room where we sometimes meet. If you're lucky, you know somebody. <laughs> but a lot of the teachers feel isolated. I feel like 
And from the few conversations that I had with some teachers who I do know, that's that's my that's my feeling. So um, I think that it's up to the leadership and up to the management to understand uh, that having having that lecture community, research community, um, it doesn't have to be research, but it, it, <laughs> some sort of space, right? Creating mm -hmm. a common shared space, a physical space, uh, information space. I don't know emotional space <laughs> for lectures yeah. to be together. It would be it would be good, and, and I don't know if I don't know if in higher education that's common. And I'm very happy to find out. Right. <laughs> so I hope that maybe my 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 studies in this masters. Um, I'm studying different things. I'm studying some business aspects, some management aspects, some financial aspects because apparently that's also important <laughs> when leading <laughs> educational institutions. That's a tough one for me, but I'm learning. I'm happy to learn. Um, but um, yeah, I, I'd like to understand how to create, uh, how to make university a good place, not only for students to be, you know, yeah. but also for for for, for lecturers to be and uh, uh, be a good selling point. <laughs> you know, this is a good place to work right. for for teachers. And is it? The fact that there isn't a sort of shared space, a staff room, as you, you were talking about before, is that cultural to Vietnam, do you think, or cultural to higher education in Vietnam, or have you yet to sort of discover that? I'm yet to discover that, but I want to say that I think that my Rikyo experience was different. Mm -hmm. um, so that stands out. I'm... I don't know yet, and I would like to research that more definitely. How uh, how these spaces are organized in other universities, you know, small and big, and small to compare uh, the right range. <laughs> um, but if I think about Moscow State University, my first university job yeah. uh, in Russia, right? For five years I worked there, and we had uh, one little room, literally one room for thirty teachers, mm -hmm. exactly. Because they were, there was very rarely a time when all of us would be together at the same time in their room, because people teach their class, they come in, they come, they they leave. Some sometimes you come to university building, teach your class, and never need to go to that staff room, you know? Right. Um. So, so that was was that particular of physics faculty of my university? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so, to be mm -hmm. honest. So I have a feeling that maybe uh, unless educational leadership, educational leaders at high, in higher education, unless they organize those spaces, uh, mm -hmm. probably the natural way is this way, the flexible way, the kind of part-time, <laughs> quote-unquote, part-time way of organizing lectures work. You know, you don't want, maybe, maybe there's this idea that this is not school, you don't need to have your... Your, your desk you don't have you don't necessarily have a lot of handouts or mm -hmm. i don't know supplies you know there's a different different sort of education is expected and so the environment needs to be different um i don't know yet this is exactly what i'm interested in researching more about interesting so of all the aspects of your masters that's the area that most appeals to you is it yeah i don't know if it's if i i, I don't know if i'll have a chance to um really get into that we have the final the final project it's called professional project so kind of problem solving i don't know yet the details but i think it must be some problem solving uh project so maybe i will try to focus on that for my school uh, but also i'm um, i'm planning to apply for a research grant a japanese in fact <laughs> research grant uh just to, to have a more comprehensive research about exactly that, find some find some universities uh, and explore explore their spaces. How do they create those spaces for lectures? If they do, right? And uh, yeah, I suppose that's my that's my track at the moment. And do you see yourself um, in the medium term once you've completed this? moving more towards academia, moving more towards 
leadership in a university environment? Is that something you'd like to do? Um, this is a good question. Well, you <laughs> and I suppose I should be asking yet. myself more often. <laughs> <laughs> more often, <laughs> yes. I have to say that uh, starting um, starting master's study, and I'm doing it uh, offline on campus. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's the same campus where I work, so it's very convenient. <laughs> of course. But I do study on the weekends, and, and there's a lot of reading and writing, and uh, it's a lot of pressure. But I realized I started in January, so I, I did four courses by now. I have finished four courses. Um, and I, I really love it. I have to say that now I haven't studied for a month and I'm really missing it. Mm. <laughs> I'm missing doing research. I'm missing doing research, like regularly having to do it. I'm missing writing, uh, mm. thinking about it, discussing uh, this thing. So uh, if there is, at the same time, I don't want to be doing uh, academia work only. Because mm -hmm. I, I really feel like work classroom is the place where I need to draw ideas from. I need to draw my inspiration from. Also, I definitely know that I do need that community of teachers. Uh, again, get the energy from them, be pushed by other teachers, have projects with other teachers. Uh, so at the moment, um, I have a friend uh, in Singapore, Eunice, mm -hmm. hello for listening <laughs> <laughs> she is my she's my she's my research buddy uh, at this point um and that i find it necessary for me so maybe that's why i'm so uh, i'm so focused on this teacher community is <laughs> because i feel like i need it myself so in a way i'm trying to do something that would help me uh right. in, in the end and what about vietnam do you think you've found your place in the world i mean you were saying definitely southeast asia but do you see yourself continuing Vietnam for the near future or for the long term? Or haven't you, are you open to move again to somewhere else? Yeah, this is a, another difficult question, Graham. <laughs> so I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry for asking you all these difficult questions, Alan. You, you can just not answer it if you prefer. <laughs> no, I, prefer I like thinking out loud. Uh, and, uh, of course, I think about it a lot. Uh, at the moment, this is a good place for me to be. Um, mm -hmm. I do, I'm doing my studies. Um, I love the place, like I said. Like, there's nothing that... Uh, repels me in some way <laughs> repels a strong word but you know what i mean there's nothing yeah. that's pushing me away uh mostly everything is pulling me in um and uh, i feel like i could be useful in my workplace as well i think this for me is an important uh, feeling to have of course uh, i feel like i could i could make it better and I would like to do something to make it better for the for the lecturers, for example, the students as well. But at the moment, somehow my focus is on the, the lecturers. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah. With that said, I do have the itch to travel and try teaching at other in other locations as well. I'm really interested in communicating with teachers from other contexts, broadly mm -hmm. speaking, other contexts, right? Different continents. <laughs> for example um, uh, and that was my idea back in 2011 and 2000, 2013 uh, when I first went to Asia uh, to Japan and I met these teachers who were teaching English in an absolutely different classroom than I had been teaching in Moscow and it just was so exciting to me and I visited some of the classrooms in Japan and I visited some of the classrooms in Korea um, back then classrooms of my friends and i took a lot of notes and i just learned a lot <laughs> so being a class observing a class of a, a teacher from from a different country without any strings attached necessarily right i was not i was not the, um giving them any feedback or it, i did not have any job attached it was yeah. just for my own learning so from so from 10 years ago i had this idea that wouldn't it be great if I could go to classrooms on different continents, you know, and if I could see what teachers, how how, how learning happens, how teaching happens in Mexico, <laughs> in yeah. South Africa, in Australia, 
uh, in, in France and so on. Um, so that is still on my, uh, it's probably falling to the bottom of my to-do list just because I'm getting older, <laughs> but still not, I'm, I'm not crossing it out. So I'd love to have an opportunity to live and teach somewhere else for sure. Yes. Uh, so maybe that's a long way to say, uh, I think I will at some point feel like I have to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think I think it's a great attitude to have a, an open mind like you do and to just to it it sounds a lot like you're very good at spotting opportunities and grasping them uh, whenever they come up and following your kind of intuition and your feeling about what is good for you to do, which is which is a great talent or skill to have. Uh, it certainly comes through after talking to you. Thank you. I feel uh, I feel probably that intuition uh, plays a big part in my life. It's true. I like mm -hmm. to. I'd like to be able to keep hearing it, <laughs> to remember that I have it, and I'd like to keep but hearing it. It. <laughs> it certainly sounds like it's something that you 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 use a lot of, and um, you know. Um, so I don't think something like that will go away. I think it's something that's probably very much a part of you. Yeah, maybe strengthens too. Graham, uh, yeah. I remember to talk about gamification. Oh, studies. yes, you're right. <laughs> if I have tell me, tell me about it, of I course, of course. So uh, one of the first courses that I studied in my program, mm -hmm. uh, again, this is Master of Education, Leadership and Management. One of the first courses was... Um, uh, contemporary people management. So this is a human resource sort of course, uh, but in a little bit wider, wider context, you know, uh, human resource element. Uh, and the, the, our lecture, we had one online class once, and our lecture invited uh, invited uh, an expert, let's say, a person who created an online online learning platform mm -hmm. company. Maybe it's company is the right word, uh, yeah. offering adult adult education classes and critical thinking, some skills. So not English classes, but some skills for business and skills for for success. <laughs> Let's go this way. By the way, soft skills education is very counseling and in general the broadly area of soft skills is very very popular in Vietnam. Right, of course. Online, yeah. offline, and so on. Um, and so, um, there was a there was a, the session was based on how digital how how digital <laughs> digital people management um, differs maybe from face to face people management and the elements of um, organizing work because the employees in that company are um, working. Off, 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 online, right? Yeah. And so a lot of, a lot of it. My classmates, my classmates in that program are teachers mm. themselves. For, for the most part, some of them are administrators at the at my at the university, but most of them are teachers. So yeah, uh, a lot of them were interested in the aspect of di just digitalization of education, right? Yeah. And, in the in the conversations in that class, uh, the idea of gamifying <laughs> gamifying I don't know if they use the word quite how you would use it uh, yeah. gamifying the class gamifying that online classroom yeah um, and also sort of sort of gamifying I don't know if that's the right uh, yeah the right way yeah. to put it the environment tracking tracking systems for. Um, employee for for work basically from the employee and manager perspective so it was, it was an yeah. unusual <laughs> unusual callback that's interesting that's interesting i definitely think that i think gamification can really play a part when something is a little bit dry or has a tendency of being a bit dry you can use certain right. aspects of of gamification certain elements of that you find in games to just inject a little bit of fun or a little bit of lightheartedness you know it doesn't need to be everything doesn't need to be so serious etc 
And those, so long as you don't overdo it, I think those people who, there, there are people who will appreciate it and it will, they'll feel more motivated to participate, et cetera. And especially online, I think, um, if things, if you can add anything to any environment, but especially online, to make something a little bit more memorable or a little bit more different, I think that's where things like gamification can really play its part. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I didn't end up, uh, even though I did take your course and I thought about gamification, I did uh, also, of course, get some uh, more input on that in my life, but uh, my my interest went in, an, in another direction. But I see a lot of interest for gamifying classrooms in various ways here in yeah. Vietnam. I think this idea, this idea of uh, classroom, motivating classroom, you know, uh, yeah. because there's such a big demand for English here right now. <laughs> I think all all ideas are very welcome and um, dig digital digital elements also. So whatever is new um, is. It's becoming very popular quickly here. Yeah, I must admit that um, m my professional life took me away from games and gamifying gamification too for a little while, and more towards sort of uh, other areas. Um, you can't do everything right, <laughs> and right. Yeah. Uh, uh, but recently I've been sort of there's a number of people who have asked me if I could do certain talks etc on gamification they remembered my interest in it and so i'm i feel i'm being drawn and pulled back towards it a little bit more and it is an area that i think there's so much more you can learn about uh and it's also an area i think that's very still game using games and language learning i think and gamification and language learning is an area that is still so much to explore and so much that people haven't sort of try to do things i i i see there's there's a kind of small number of people doing uh work in that area but it's still yet to reach a sort of larger understand a greater understanding i think yeah i agree about understanding for sure mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. there you go great <laughs> Going back. So, so anna i'm going to draw things to a close now i just want to say I've really enjoyed um, talking to you. I mean, the main, one of the main reasons why I do this show is it gives me an excuse to to reach out and contact people like yourself who I think are doing really interesting things in the world of education that I'm connected to or or, or to meet new people as well and really have this sort of in-depth conversation about what you're doing and how your trajectory has been. Uh, I find it really interesting to to do that and so this gives me an excuse to probably have this kind of conversation that we would never have otherwise because we just never find time as, right. as teachers as, as educators do we to, to to actually talk about this in at length so thank you very much for your time and uh for sharing uh everything with with us today thank you i'm I was very happy. It was my pleasure, and now I'm excited and thinking about whether I should also uh, whether whether I can start my own podcast and also talk to teachers and make my community that way. <laughs> yeah, well, if you would like to be a host on, if you'd like to be a host on Teachers Talk Radio, there's a lot of uh, they're looking for people to to do that. So, um, all right. I'll consider <laughs> consider it you go to the website and uh and you'll find more information about it or you can ask me if you're interested i can put you in touch with uh the the people who can make it happen etc um and it doesn't have to be you know i i kind of do this show once every three weeks i think the first saturday of the month um someone else does it which suits me but you can adapt schedules to suit you your time the time you have right. available there are people there are show hosts that just do it once a month for example there are others that do it once a week and um it's a good community it's a really nice way of 
of giving you an excuse to get in touch with teachers and being part of this PLN, as you say, sort of um, a community of teachers online. So definitely recommend That's it. True. And it's very nice to hear the voices. It's very nice to, to hear the voice. You know, we all communicate uh, by typing. <laughs> we can see the yeah. text. But voice yeah. is different. Voice is different. Definitely. And, and each show generally gets around th- between 350 and 500 plus listens in the end, um, which is nice. It's mm-hmm. nice. It's nice. So think about it if you're interested and have the time, of course. Right. Sounds like you might be a little right. bit busy at the moment. <laughs> I do tend to, to get busy and busier. <laughs> As we again. all do. As it we was all lovely do. to talk. Thank you. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. It's the summer holidays for almost everyone, but apologies for those not quite finished yet. And the topic of money is not far from the thoughts of many. But Schools Week looks back at the year and reports that nearly two thirds of schools increased the cost of pupil meals this year and the large majority of schools have had to make cuts in other areas. The findings are taken from regular government surveys of school leaders and teachers, and results show that over one quarter of schools say support with energy bills made no real difference to financial positions. The pressure of the cost of living crisis affected schools in several key ways. These included a rise in the cost of pupil lunches, which had to be passed on to many parents, Some schools also reported a decline in meal quality as providers attempted to reduce costs. Cuts to support staff and, in some cases, teaching staff. And schools struggled to comply with new statutory guidance on uniform, with many schools opting to introduce a second-hand uniform scheme to support parents. Recruitment pressures led to schools appointing non-specialist teachers for subjects such as history and technology with many schools saying this increased workload and stress. Send pressures also increased, with 87% of those surveyed citing lack of funds and access to specialist services as the key issue. The same publication also featured a story on exam fees, as AQA, England's largest exam board, announced increases for some of its most popular GCSE and A-level subjects, by as much as 16.5%. The changes will affect the 2024 series. The article features details of increases made by Edexcel and OCR too. Jeff Barton, General Secretary of the ASCO Union, responded by saying that this latest price hike will only serve to stretch budgets even further. Exam boards are obliged to notify Ofqual of any proposed fee increases. Ofqual monitors pricing for qualifications from the not-for-profit exam boards. The Guardian covered the nomination of Sir Martin Oliver as Ofsted's next Chief Inspector by Education Secretary Gillian Keegan. A pre-appointment hearing will take place in the autumn, but Ms Keegan said Sir Martin had demonstrated exemplary leadership and praised his work in areas of disadvantage as the Chief Executive of Outwood Grange Academies Trust. Sir Martin said he was hugely privileged to be nominated and that he would work closely with the whole sector to create the best systems in all areas. His proportion comes in spite of criticism, including from Ofsted inspectors, of his trust's record on pupil suspensions and exclusions. The article goes on to highlight the issues Sir Martin may find lurking in his intray if he is confirmed for a January 2024 start. These include the outcome of the inquest into the death of Ruth Perry and the calls for a full-scale review of the inspectorate, 
including the scrapping of single word judgments. The inspection of children's services at a time when there is a high turnover of social workers and an over-reliance on agency workers who are having to deal with heavy caseloads. He will also have to deal with media and political pressures in a role which could see him regularly in the spotlight. Finally, the BBC reports that the government will break its own deadline to provide schools in England with guidance on policies for transgender pupils. The guidance has been promised before the summer break, but is delayed because the Attorney General for England and Wales has advised parts of the guidance may be unlawful. The guidance was expected to address what schools should do if a child wanted to change their name or use different pronouns, and whether to involve parents. Ministers were considering advising against allowing social transitioning in schools after a 2020 report found that it was not a neutral act, and more information was needed about its outcomes. The Attorney General, however, has said that an outright ban would be unlawful. Ministers now have to decide what to do next compile lawful guidance or contemplate changing the law altogether. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, this week we're going to talk about a couple of shortcuts and hacks that can make life a little easier. This may not be as innovative as some of my past life hacks for teachers, like drinking noodles, but here are a couple of things that may make a difference to your use of media in the classroom. First up, if you aren't already riding it, get on the Wakelet Wave. Wakelet is a free way to save, organise and share content create collections of web pages, videos and basically anything with a web address under one topic. Once done, you have a shareable link to your collection. Use it to organise your lesson, flip a lesson or create revision collections just to throw a few ideas out there. This next hack is one of my favourites. I love using YouTube to support learning. Not only can it help keep pace in a lesson, but also it's a great reference afterwards for pupils to refer to. My biggest gripe with it though is that pesky advert you can't skip that always decides to play when you're in full flow. Here's a secret that works nearly all of the time. When preparing your lesson, you will have watched the clip anyway to ensure it's appropriate. So just before you copy the link into your presentation or wakelet, type this on the end. And T equals one. That's the ampersand or the wiggly and lowercase t equals and the number one. Now copy the URL with and t equals one on the end and your clip will start one second in. Not missing any content but skipping the adverts at the start. No need to thank me. Show your gratitude with a follow and tell us what you want to know about tech. I'm Steve Woods and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods. Your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.